The next section of Unit 3 deals with region. Regions are places with unifying characteristics, and this relates to a sense of place because we determine how places are similar or different based on a region that they belong to. Characteristics of uh, places that unify could be physical geography, uh, political systems, economic systems, or cultural characteristics. And region uh, can be categorized in three different ways, formal regions, functional regions, and perceptual regions. But first, let's look at how regions are determined. Regions are a collection of places that are grouped together on the basis of one or more unifying characteristics or a specific pattern of activity. It can be a combination of cultural features like a religion, language, government, land use, or population patterns, or physical characteristics like climate or vegetation. And geographers will regionalize at all scales. Uh, you can have local regions, national regions, or even global regions. A region derives its unified character through the cultural landscape, which is a combination of cultural, religious, and physical features. And regions can change over time. Regions are also separated from one another by transition zones, which would be an area of spatial change where the peripheries of two adjacent regions join. This is generally marked by a gradual shift, not a sharp break in the characteristics that distinguish the neighboring regions. So if we think about the border region between the United States and Mexico, you're going to see uh, some pretty similar characteristics right on the border. And as you move further away from the border, uh, some of those characteristics start to change. It's this area of a mix of characteristics. And it could be areas of these transition, zo transition zones could also be areas of possible tension like between cultural groups or religious groups. This map shows the 10 large regions that are most often recognized by geographers. It includes the seven continents that are based on physical features, but also includes three cultural regions that are, share, that are based on shared languages and histories. Central America, which is here on the map, as a part of North America, but with a culture more influenced by Spain and Portugal than by Great Britain and France. Sub-Saharan Africa, shown here as a southern portion of Africa, is distinguished from the rest of Africa. And the Russian Federation, which spans both Europe and Northern Asia, um, shares characteristics of both of those continents. Geographers will also divide regions into smaller areas or subregions. A subregion shares some characteristic with the rest of the larger region, but it is distinct in some ways. For example, the region of Latin America covers parts of North and South America from Mexico to Chile. Within its subregion of Brazil, within it is the subregion of Brazil. As in other Latin American countries, uh, most people in Brazil are Roman Catholics. However, Brazil's primary language is Portuguese, which makes it unlike any other country in the mostly Spanish-speaking Latin America. Because of its language, Brazil is a distinct subregion. This map shows us the standard subregions. For example, Sub-Saharan Africa is now divided into West, Central, East, and Southern Africa. And Asia is divided into five subregions. The Middle East, Central Asia, South Asia, Asia, East Asia, and Southeast Asia. By changing the scale and zooming in, subregions can be even further divided. The further subdivisions can be based on elements of physical geography, such as climate and landform, or human, and, human geography, such as culture, politics, or e economics. Western Europe can be divided into Northwestern Europe and Southern Europe, each unified by more specific traits. Since many kinds of regions exist, any one place is a part of many regions or subregions at the same time. For example, Florida is a part of a climate region based on its warm weather. It's a part of a cultural region known as the South and an economic region known as the Sun Belt.
As stated before, there are three types of regions, the first of which is a formal region, which is based on places with similar features. Generally, formal regions are based on facts. Um, they're also called uniform or homogeneous regions, and they're united by one or more traits. Formal regions can be proven to exist, and data can be collected about them. Nations, states, counties, and cities, all of these have political boundaries that are concrete and easily proven. Uh, physical features can define a formal region. The Amazon River Basin, we can prove that tributaries flow into the Amazon River. The Sahel region of Africa is a desert region that's characterized by a specific climate, vegetation, and land use patterns. Cultural regions can uh, include places that are united by a language. For example, in southwestern Nigeria, both, most pe people speak the language Yoruba. Economic regions can also define formal regions based on types of land use. Uh, climate regions, landform regions, economic regions, we can collect data about them and prove that they are similar. For example, the Gold Coast of Africa are all major gold exporters. This map of Yellowstone National Park is an example of a formal region because it has specific boundaries and within are very specific characteristics based on physical geography. Functional regions are groups of places that are linked together by some sort of system. It can be a transportation system, it could be a utility system, electricity, media, um, or it could be a transportation system also. Generally, functional regions have a use. There is a center uh, for the system, and they're connected with the area around it by some form of system, generally organized around a focal point and defined by an activity that occurs across the region. These regions are often united by networks of communication and transportation that are center centered around a node or a hub, and for that reason, sometimes functional regions are also called nodal regions. So let's take, for example, a utility system. Water pipelines are connected to the city water service, which would be the center or the node, and homes and businesses receive water into their homes or businesses through those pipelines. For electricity, power lines carry power from the plant to homes and businesses. A delivery area for a restaurant uh, in that system, the restaurant would be the node or hub. And with cell service, our cell towers would be the node or the hub or even the satellites in space. Countries can also be functional regions uh, if you consider the capital city to be the political node or hub. The Chicago transit system is linked by the flow of commuters and there is a specific train system with a central station in the center of the city at the loop being the center or the node or the hub. Other examples include shopping areas that are focused on malls, areas that are served by uh, branch banks, and then cities and their suburbs. The interstate is uh, interstate system is an example of a functional region because it is a group of places within the United States that are linked together through a transportation system. In this sense, uh, the urban areas uh, would be the nodes or the centers or the hubs, whichever term you want to use. Perceptual regions differ from formal and functional regions in that they are defined by an informal sense of place that people ascribe to them. The boundaries of perceptual regions vary widely because people have a different sense of what defines and unites these regions. For example, the American South, the Middle East, upstate New York. While all of these regions exist, their exact boundaries depend on the person who is defining them. Oftentimes, perceptual regions can also be based on stereotypes, 
not necessarily facts. And our perceptual regions tend to reflect our own mental maps, our own perception and knowledge of the world. Uh, opinions about different parts of town, like the southern portion of town is bad, the northern portion of the town is good, are examples of a perceptual region. Countries defined by stereotypes, like all areas of the former Soviet Union are communist, or all Italians are a part of the mafia, can all be a part of the perceptual region as well. Some other examples would be uh, Southern California women are all ignorant and vain, or Southern people are hillbillies or ignorant, can all feed into our ideas of a perceptual region. This is an example of a perceptual region because of the way that they are defining the north, south, west, and midwest portions of the United States. You could ask several different people from different parts of the country or even within the same part of the country to define what subregions of the United States exist and what states are included in each of those maps will widely vary from one person to another. And this is how we know that it's a perceptual region. A force or process that makes a local or regional concept become a global phenomenon is globalization. Human activities occur in multiple locations, and the scale of our world is shrinking. We are becoming more uniform, more integrated, and interdependent based on our connectivity. And this means that our regional characteristics are becoming more and more blurred. These interconnections between regions include the exchange of natural resources, agricultural commodities, finished goods, services, people, information, money, and even environmental concerns like pollutants. Our global economy currently has three economic hearth regions. In North America, New York City. In Western Europe, London. And in Japan, Tokyo. What makes these cities the economic hearth regions? What do they have that other places don't? Specifically, they have advanced technology, capital, and purchasing wealth. We also have transnational corporations, corporations that exist across multiple countries. Research, factories, markets, they all could happen in multiple countries. Uh, with technology, we see the easy transfer of money and products, and we use the economic asset of each place. So uh, let's use the example of iPhones. The concept of an iPhone was developed in California, where there's a surge of educated labor. The parts are processed all over the world based on areas of natural resources, and those phones are assembled generally in China or other areas of East and Southeast Asia where there is an abundance of affordable labor. What are the effects of this globalized economy? Well, it means that we have an, it actually means we have an increased economic difference. There's a, a regional division of labor. Different areas will specialize in different tasks depending on the labor force, wages, and unionization. And this can lead to economic disparity. Factories will close in some areas, and then other areas will grow into commercial centers. Areas where manufacturing or nat natural resources are being provided are generally paid less and therefore have less access to technology. But they do have the knowledge of it, but without the ability to afford it. We also have a globalization of culture. Geographers observe that increasingly uniform cultural preferences produce a uniform global landscape of material artifacts and of cultural values. So for example, fast food restaurants, service stations, retail chain stores deliberately create a visual appearance that locations, so locations differ as little as possible. And this produces a sense of familiarity for the consumer in what may be an unfamiliar place overall, such as when traveling away from your hometown. For example, almost any major city that you would go to in the United States or abroad, you can find a McDonald's, a Starbucks, or a Subway. So what are the effects of this globalization? 
Well, certainly because those regional differences are becoming blurred culturally, we have an increased awareness and acceptance of cultural diversity. We have more access to diverse ways of life and products, and that increases our familiarity and decreases dissimilarity. But with this also comes the spread of intolerance and hate. Some places want to violently hold on to traditions and stop, and stop the forcing change that's happening. And often this is accompanied by a fear of the different. 